Welcome again to our lectures on language theory. These lectures are delivered for the students of speciality foreign language to foreign languages, studying at the Department of English and German Languages. This is lecture number six within the course and the first lecture in the second module, that is, of theoretical grammar. The theme of this lecture is the subject of theoretical course of English grammar. The outline of the lecture covers the following points. Goals of this module, brief history of English grammars, language and speech, definition of grammar, practical grammar versus theoretical grammar, parts of grammar, and lexical and grammatical meaning. The goals of the module theoretical grammar are as follows. To provide a description of the grammatical structure of the English language as a system, to clarify the scope of grammar in a systematic and theoretically coherent way, and to develop students' critical thinking skills. Now let's speak about the brief history of English grammars. Until the 17th century, the term grammar in English was applied only to the study of Latin. Latin grammar was the only grammar learned in schools. Until the end of the 16th century, there were no grammars of English. One of the most popular Latin grammars was written in English by William Lilly. It was published in the first half of the 16th century and went through many editions. This book was very important for English grammar as it set a standard for the arrangement of material. Latin grammatical paradigms with their English equivalents made possible the presentation of English forms in a similar way, using the same terminology as in Latin grammar. Generally speaking, the history of English grammars may be divided into two periods. The first is the age of pre-scientific grammar, beginning with the end of the 16th century and lasting till about 1900. By the middle of the 18th century, when many of the grammatical phenomena of English had been described and the English language norms established, the pre-normative grammars gave way to a new kind of grammar, a prescriptive or normative grammar. It stated strict rules of grammatical usage and set up a certain standard of correctness to be followed by mm -hmm. learners. By the end of the 19th century, when the system of grammar known in modern linguistics as traditional had been established, there appeared a new type of grammar, the scientific grammar. In contrast with prescriptive grammars, the classical scientific grammar was both descriptive and explanatory. Henry Sweet's grammar book appeared in the last decade of the 19th century. A New English Grammar, Logical and Historical The title of the book speaks for itself, so it is common practice nowadays to take the date of 1900 as the dividing light between the two periods in the history of English grammars and the beginning of the age of the scientific grammar. Classical scientific grammar accepted the traditional grammatical system of prescriptive grammars. During the first half of the 20th century, an intensive development of scientific English grammar took place, with great contributions to it being made by Otto Jesperson. In the 1950s, a new trend in linguistic studies came to the fore, that is, the structural grammar. It was very popular with grammarians for about 40 years and took different directions in its development, 
which are known as descriptive linguistics, transformational grammar, generative grammar, and generative semantics. The first linguist to speak of a language as a system or a structure of smaller systems were Baudouin de Courtenay and Fortunatov of Russia and the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. You can see their pictures here. Now let's speak about the concepts of language and speech. Language is the system, phonological, lexical, and grammatical, which lies at the base of all speaking. Speech, on the other hand, is the manifestation of language or its use by various speakers and writers of the given language. Text is the result of the process of speech. Language is social by nature. It grows and develops with the development of society. It exists in individual minds, but serves the purposes of social intercourse through speech, originally oral speech, but nowadays to a great extent written speech. The three constituent parts of language are the phonological system, the lexical system, and the grammatical system. The unity of these three elements forms a language. The system of language includes the body of material units, sounds, phonemes, morphemes, words, lexemes, word groups, sentences, and superphrasal unities. According to them, we distinguish between six levels of linguistic analysis. Three main branches of linguistics dealing with the main linguistic units are phonetics, phonology, lexicology, and grammar. Grammar is the study of the grammatical structure of language. It includes morphology, and syntax. Morphology is the part of grammar which treats the forms of words. Syntax is the part of grammar which treats phrases and sentences. The borderline between the two is conventional, and there are cases of overlapping. While free phrases fall under syntax, the formations like have been found, has been raining, are referred to as analytical word forms and fall under morphology. Set phrases make the subject of phraseology as a branch of lexicology. The grammatical signals have a meaning of their own, independent of the meaning of the notional words. This can be illustrated by the following sentence with nonsensical words. Woggles, Agd, Diggles. According to Charles Fries, the morphological and the syntactic signals in the given sentence make us understand that several actors acted upon some objects. This sentence, which is a syntactic signal, makes the listener understand it as a declarative sentence whose grammatical meaning is actor, action, thing acted upon. One can easily change, transform the sentence into the singular, a woggle act a diggle. Negative, a woggle did not act a diggle. Or interrogative, did a woggle act a diggle? All these operations are grammatical. The conclusion is that the main units of grammar are structures. But grammar can be practical and theoretical. Let's have a look at the difference between them. Practical grammar is often used to refer to the best means of achieving a good command of a language. It prescribes a set of nominative rules based on the standard English. Theoretical grammar can be understood in a more scholarly way 
as the framework of grammatical concepts throughout the centuries. Theoretical grammar describes and analyzes facts of the language without giving any prescriptions. It is a scientific type of grammar and it does not give a ready answer about how certain grammatical phenomena should be interpreted. Now we'll speak a bit in more detail about parts of grammar. Morphology deals with the paradigmatic relations of morphemes and words, while syntax deals with the syntagmatic relations in phrases and sentences. Syntagmatic relations are immediate linear relations between units in a segmental sequence. Syntagmatically connected are words and word groups in the sentence, morphemes within words, phonemes within morphemes and words. Syntax, as a part of grammar, studies syntagmatic relations of words in phrases and sentences. Thus, in any language, there are certain classes of words which have their own positions in sentences. They may also be considered to be grammatical means of a language. So we can come to the conclusion that the basic means of the grammatical structure of language are sentence structure and grammatical word classes. In connection with this, Grammar is divided into two parts, grammar which deals with sentence structure and grammar which deals with grammatical word classes. And the first is syntax uh, and the second is morphology. And we will finish our lecture uh, discussing the lexical and grammatical meaning. Some morphemes are independent and directly associated with some object of reality, while others are dependent and are connected with the world of reality only indirectly. Have a look at these examples. Desk, desks, bag, bags, work, worked, lie, lied. The first elements of these words are not dependent as the second elements. More themes of the first type are called lexical and meanings they express are lexical. The elements like s, ed, d, are called grammatical morphemes and meanings they express are grammatical. Thus, lexical meaning is characteristic to lexical morphemes, while grammatical meanings are characteristic to grammatical morphemes. Grammatical meanings are expressed not only by forms of word changing, that is by affixation, but also by free morphemes that are used to form analytical word forms. For instance, he will study, I shall go. The meaning of shall and will is considered to be grammatical, since comparing the relations of invite, invited, shall invite, we can see that the function of shall is similar to that of grammatical morphemes S or ED. So the function of shall and will is to express the future simple tense. That is the difference between the lexical and grammatical meaning. As usual, you are offered to answer a set of comprehension questions. If you can answer them, uh, you can be sure you have understood the content of the question of the lecture.
And here you are provided a list of sources for your further reading. Thank you for attention.